Welcome to Inside New York's Art World. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is Robert Indiana, the man who invented love and who also created a mainstream in the river that was pop art. Words are central to the entire body of his work and the cornerstone of his highly personal and paradoxical work, work that vividly evokes the signs and the slogans of American life. Of course, your most widely known work is love. Perhaps we should begin by your telling us how you happen to create love. What's the evolution of that emblem that has been given, I guess, the widest public exposure of any work of art? Well, it all started, um, Barbara Lee, a long, long time ago. And it, it comes from a, of course, a a spiritual rather than erotic beginning. Uh, when I was a child, I was exposed and, and involved in the Christian Science Church. And uh, all Christian Science Churches are very prim and pure. Uh, most of them have no decoration whatsoever, no stained glass windows, no, no, no carvings, no paintings. And uh, in fact, only one thing appears in a Christian Science Church, and that's a small, very tasteful uh, inscription in gold, usually, uh, over the platform where the readers conduct the service. And that inscription, of course, is, um, God is love. Well, uh, a few years ago, mid-60s, I suppose, a wealthy um, Seventh Avenue dress manufacturer who makes his home in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and who has long been a patron of the Museum of Modern Art. In fact, it was his fund which, which permitted the Museum of Modern Art to acquire my very first painting, um, the, what has now become the first American dream, although it was at that time just the American dream. You're talking of Larry Aldridge, I I'm assume. talking of Larry Aldridge. And uh, Larry, um, in his hometown of Ridgefield, or where he lives, rather, um, had the inspiration to, to expose his rather large private collection to a broader public. And there happened to be a building available, which had been a, oh, a grocery store back in the 18th, early 19th century, run by two revolutionary uh, war veterans. And this grocery store, later on, sometime in the 20s, became a Christian Science Church. And the Christian scientists wanted better facilities, so built themselves a new church next door. Well, I was at a party at Andy Warhol's old uh, factory when it was near the UN. And Aldridge was there. I didn't know him very well, but uh, well enough to, to confront him, I was a little piqued because he had no Indiana, and I thought he should. And uh, I told him that uh, an excellent opportunity was forthcoming for a, for a special Indiana, because since he was making his museum in a former Christian Science Church, I'd, I had an idea to do a special painting for him. And that was the reversal of the religious motto. I made a painting which read, Love is God, instead. Well, that was 19, I think, 1964. Actually, I had done a small love painting in 1962, but that was an incidental painting in, in a long stream of small canvases that I did. That I had no particular concentration on the subject or involvement with. However, with the love is God, although the canvas bears no relationship to what has now become a logo, um, it started me thinking about the subject of love. And I had been um, at one time employed in the dark days when things weren't going so well as um, a typist to the man who was to become the Bishop of California. And that man, of course, is Dean Pike, and later Bishop Pike, and now, of course, uh, sort of in some area of sainthood, I suppose. Um, he, of course, was greatly involved with the subject of love particularly from an ecclesiastic standpoint, and has written a book, I think, entitled Love. And um, I, all these things kind of came together. And uh, since uh, I like to work on a square canvas, and since the way I 
put the letters down. It is the most economical, the most dynamic way to put four letters on a square canvas. This is how the love came about. Too long? Not at all. <laughs> Did you uh, ever expect the image to be received the way it was? Did its, Did its success surprise you? And does it currently please you? Well, most of the loves that people see, Barbara Lee, are ripoffs. And uh, very early on, I put myself into a position of not being able to defend myself against this particular practice. In other words, hippie patches and waste paper baskets and wallpaper and what have you. Um, uh, nothing of that ever comes to me. Um, of course, the love has been a major involvement in my own life. I've done many love paintings, I've done love sculpture, I've done love prints, I've done, uh, I wear a love ring, which is from an edition of a hundred, which is my own, and there's even a love tapestry, a small edition of ten. The, the postage stamp is obviously the biggest burden, in that out of 333 million stamps, I, I collected a designer's fee of a thousand dollars. Obviously, your work, that work, was not copyrighted, is that correct? That was the initial problem. Um, with the copyright laws, every single thing has to be uh, bear the copyright business. And of course, um, it just went on and on and on from there. Why did you choose the colors of the red, blue, and green? Your work is so personal, so idiosyncratic, that I assume it was not accidental. No, not at all. Most all of my work is, is very um, autobiographical in one way or another, Barbara Lee. Um, in the 30s, and it's a fairly well-known story, um, my father worked for Philip 66. And in the 30s, that was during the Depression, uh, all Philip 66 gasoline stations were red and green. The pumps were red and green, the uniforms were red and green, the oil cans were red and green. Frank Phillips, who founded the company, just had a thing about red and green. And of course, to most people, it's not a terribly attractive, uh, most people don't wear red and green. Most living rooms are not red and green. It's, it's simply Christmas. But he had a thing about it, and as soon as he died, of course, the company changed everything. There's no longer any red and green. But as a kid, my mother used to drive my father to work in Indianapolis. And I would see, practically every day of my young life, a huge Philip 66 sign. It stood over the old Monon railroad tracks, a train that used to go to Chicago. And uh, so it is the red and green of that sign against the blue sky. The blue in the love is a cerulean that accounts for the red, blue, and green. Robert, Indiana, how did you come to be named after a Midwestern state? Well, I come to be so named because I took the name, Robert. Um, I didn't start out in life as Robert, Indiana, but at a fairly early point in my career in New York City, um, there were already a number of recognizable artists who had my own rather common name, and I just felt that was going to be a awkward uh, embarrassment and a disadvantage. I could feel that something was going to be happening very shortly, and I didn't want to have something nice happen with the burden of a name that I didn't like. And uh, it was just like uh, going through a revolving door from night into day. Uh, the first thing that happened, of course, was simply the very first major painting that was sold in New York was sold to the Museum of Modern Art. Which and picture was that? That's the American dream. And that just doesn't happen to, to everybody. And that was an incredible stroke of luck. And uh, I couldn't help but associate that with the fact, uh, you know, one, one could say, would the painting have been bought if it were not painted by someone named Robert Indiana instead of uh, uh, Bob Smith or Bob Clark or, uh, you know, th there is a magic there's a definite magic to names. In fact, one of my most recent canvases celebrates that fact. I've Can you done, tell us uh, about that? Uh, Barbara Lee has seen it in my studio. I, it started out as a print, and, and that's not usually how I work. My prints usually follow my paintings. But um, this was a commission from a publisher in, in Germany to celebrate Picasso's 90th birthday. And I really, I don't feel honored very often, but uh, this really did seem like a, a little bit of a special 
uh, thing to have happen because the first person to ask was Miro and, and all of Picasso's immediate close artistic friends. 60, I think eventually something like 60 artists contributed to this portfolio. Um, I did mine, unfortunately I'm a procrastinator and I kind of drubbed my brush and so it didn't get done until after his death. So in the painting is worked his death date. But um, in thrashing around for a theme, I mean, like, how do, how do you deal with the subject of Picasso? It's, it's, it's so big. Um, I could have done six, I could have done a portfolio on Picasso. But what occurred to me is Picasso was a name changer, too. When did you choose, decide to choose this particular form of expression, the use of the word that is so incorporated in your work? It was as a, now you ask me date? Uh, the evolution, the genesis of that in your work. Well, as I say, about um, in the late 50s, uh, this was abstract expressionism. Um, everybody was dripping and dragging and doing something tortured to their canvases. And uh, they were getting, those canvases were getting bigger and bigger. And if you wanted to hold your head up in the artistic community, they really had to cover a wall. Well, I was working part-time in an art store selling art supplies, and I didn't have money for large canvases or all of that paint, whether it would be Duco or what. So um, in my kind of, I guess, native urge to economize, um, I simply, there in front of my studio down on Quinty Slip, were all of these 19th century buildings being demolished. And here was all this gorgeous uh, debris, uh, beams, uh, pieces of iron, stencils, um, all kinds of goodies. And since I am a, uh, whatever that is, Collector. a squirrel, uh, <laughs> I collected this stuff. And of course, once it was in my studio, then, uh, well, what do you do with it? Well, the, the form which was most beautiful, and it was it was the beams from these old buildings. And they were beautiful because not only did they have a, a gorgeous patination, the, the, the rain, the, the dripping on them, the age, they were all well over 100 years old. But they had this peculiar shape on the top, which is called a haunched tenon. And it's simply the key for fitting one beam into another beam. There would be the female uh, piece over here, and there would be the male piece here, and the two would the two would lock together. Is that why you call them harems? Yes, of course. Uh, and, and so I set them upright, and they really did look like harems, the, the classical marble sculpture, which would be set at roadsides and so forth, and kind of point to the next town. Now, uh, they existed. As I said, they were beautiful pieces of wood. I used only rusted iron. I put rusted wheels on them and uh, various elements. I grew a little weary of that because as you can see, I, I do like color. And so around 1959, color started to appear on these early constructions. Somehow polychrome sculpture is not too, uh, or at that time wasn't too abundant either. That was rather a different approach. And um, the word appeared. Now exactly why the word appeared, I'm not sure. But since columns are about this wide, the word couldn't get much longer than love, but most of them were really three-letter words. And eat and die were two of my favorite words at that time. Um, eat and die in particular uh, stem from the fact that uh, eat happened to be the very last word that my mother said to me before she died. And that stuck very, very vividly in my mind. And I think that accounts for it, really. However, eat, die uh, has something to say about the consumerism of America and maybe uh, the destiny of all organisms. In 1957, when you were sculpting in these and working in these found object mm -hmm. materials, you were living at Coenty Slip. And at that very same time, there were, another, there were a group of artists that were living there together at the same time. Who were they and did any of them influence your work or vice versa? Let me digress one, just a tiny little bit, Barbara Lee. When I was working in that art store on 57th Street, it's disappeared now, it was called Frederick's, and it was down the street from the Art Students League, not, not one of those right across the street. Um, 
After working there for three years, I got the distinction or the elevation of being allowed to decorate the window. And uh, that really was a relief after uh, all those years of selling art supplies. Uh, one of the postcards I put in the window was Matisse's Still Life with Oysters. And one day someone came in and asked for that particular postcard. And that someone happened to be Ellsworth Keller. Well, this is how I met Ellsworth. Well, Ellsworth had been living not on Quinty Slip, but had been living on Broad Street for maybe a year or so. He had had his first New York show at Betty Parsons, and although I didn't know it, was a member of the art community. Um, but he was a nice person. And uh, yeah, I, told him, <laughs> I told him my problems, and he was sympathetic. Uh, I was being thrown out of my loft over here on Fourth Avenue. And I desperately needed a new place. And he said, well, my God, the, in, down where I live, there are hundreds of empty lofts. And of course, there were. So I, he made contact with someone that he knew. And there was a loft immediately facing the river. Out the front window, you can see the Brooklyn Bridge. And, and here are all the tugs going by and the ships. And it was just about the most romantic setting you could imagine. Uh, I uh, went to the landlord. and. And he said, you can have the place for $35, and I'll put in the three front windows. Or you can have the place for $30, and you put in the front window. So I took it for $30 and put in my front windows. Well, Ellsworth very shortly then moved to the slip. And he was followed by uh, Jack Youngerman. And he had known Jack for about six years in Paris. And uh, both Youngerman and Kelly had enormous influences in Paris. They were still of that generation that Paris meant something. Uh, to me, Paris meant absolutely nothing. Um, so Jack came with his wife, and at that time, that was Delphine Sirig, who was later to become the star of last year at Marienbad, a marvelous uh, French gal. And uh, Ellsworth was also responsible, f I probably for Agnes Martins being on the slip. She lived there at she, that time. She lived in about three different locations on the slip. She was my next door neighbor for several years. And uh, we were very, very close. And it was she who brought me into my greatest communion with Gertrude Stein. Why don't we talk for a moment about the auto-portraiture that characterizes a great deal of your work, particularly that sequence, and you made some earlier reference to it, known as the American Dream. And if your work is essentially autobiographical, perhaps you would decipher some of the symbols in that series for us. Mm -hmm. Well, Barbara Lee is referring to, it's very vivid in her mind because she's just seen the paintings in my studio. If any of you saw my, my last exhibit at Denise Renee in 1972, um, there were 10 paintings uh, being exhibited called Decade Auto Portraits. And in a sense, this series is an extension of my American dream. And my American dreams are, after all, my American dreams and, and how I relate to that whole business. Uh, the auto portraits uh, stem from that mainly just from a form aspect. The, the how the canvas is devised is, is very close. Um, the, Auto portrait, uh, the decade is the 10 years of the 1960s. And probably for me, as for any person, a certain decade is the most meaningful one in one's life. I don't think any other decade will mean the same thing to me as the 60s did. I've done uh, two foot auto portraits, I've done four foot auto portraits, and now I'm on my largest series, which is a uh, six foot size canvases. So in my own mind, there's a great kind of jumble and confusion. I can, I can pick out uh, highlights, uh, Barbara Lee. For instance, uh, the word die does appear uh, frequently. And it appears in a year, say, like 1963, when there was a major assassination. It might also appear in another suite, uh, the year that my father died. My, my red, blue, and green 1966 goes back 
to the love. My love show was in 1966. My father was born in June, the sixth month, into a family of six children and worked for Philip 66 and left my mother and went to California via Highway 66, passing all those little signs that said, use 666, which was a cold remedy. Uh, I do get caught up with just very commonplace, everyday kind of visual things like that. Why is death such a recurring theme in your well, painting. remember, I, if you have any knowledge of Christian science, uh, Barbara Lee, um, there is no death, you see. And that made a rather odd impression on me because I, I really couldn't quite buy that. I mean, you know, it was difficult when, when the, all the members of my family were kind of passing away like flies. <laughs> and uh, so it was an irony which was on my mind, you see. If you weren't raised as a Christian science, it might not be so strange. Who are the artists to whose work you most respond? Well, obviously the artist who has been the greatest influence on me personally was that man who bought a postcard off of me, uh, and that was Ellsworth Kelly. Well, there are some other and earlier antecedents to whose, whose work yours is often likened to, and I'm thinking of Dumuth and Stuart Davis. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Stuart Davis, I, I f always felt not influenced by, and mainly because I don't like impasto, and of course all his canvases, the paint's about that thick. However, uh, somewhere back there, yes, I, I suppose I was influenced by Stuart Davis. All those words and, and all of that jargon, and a kind of, uh, he's a little jazzier than I am. But um, uh, Demuth is another, is another matter altogether. If you're, I don't know whether you people are art history buffs or not, but there's a... They're more than buffs, they're students. They're more than buffs, they're students. There's a marvelous painting, and it's an homage to Gertrude Stein, and it is particular because there are two Stein things here, and I'm greatly caught up in the, in the Gertrude Stein legend and myth. Um, he did a painting, uh, homage to Gertrude Stein, in which the numbers one, two, three appear. A mask appears, and of course, he who changes his name is wearing a mask, and uh, love appears, the word love. Now, I had never seen that painting when I started painting my love paintings. I saw it only afterward. It's not a very um, overly exposed painting, but it was recently in New York and then went on to a big collection in New York. You mentioned earlier that when you first met Ellsworth Kelly, you didn't realize he was a part of the art community. How important is it to be a part of the art establishment? Well, enormously, uh, Barbara Lee, if you want to, uh, in uh, quotation marks, uh, make it, shall we say. Um, everything in life seems to be uh, who you know and uh, when you know them and where you are and to be at the right place at the right time with the, with the right thing is about what pop amounted to and it's certainly my case. Um, I mean that's putting it very grossly but um, it's um, a matter of contacts. I mean all of life is a matter of, of the web that one one weaves between one's fellow human beings. And what about and, that uh, question of, you know, the, the virtuoso? The virtuoso? What uh, you mean? That talent. He, he who is able that to. That is someplace um, between talent and akin to genius that emerges. Well, um, how important is it to have a dealer? Would a virtuoso, would that artist of artists, would Picasso need a dealer? Well, since Picasso had a dealer all his life, and it turned out to be the one same brilliant man, I, I suppose there's no denying that. Uh, however, one has to find some kind of a, of a interlocking professional human relationship just to, just to get the, uh, the cart moving, shall we say. One, one can fill up one studio with X number of paintings and then either they go someplace or you, you have to move. And, and I've seen many artists who are just, their work was simply on top of them. Uh, I, we mentioned one, uh, we talked about Agnes Martin. Uh, Agnes Martin had her early shows at Betty Parsons and meant absolutely nothing, nothing happened at all. It, it took her, her 
near insanity and her and her moving away from New York and making herself into a myth to to get her wagon moving. I mean, it's it's one can arrive at these things in various manners. What is it that you are saying when you build this idea? Well, we are living in America, Barbara Lee, and obviously in my own lifetime, uh, that has changed very, very much. America is not the America that I knew as a, as a kid in the Depression. Uh, I can see people here who, who may have experienced that. I mean, we've simply become a different kind of country. Uh, however, it is still America, and I would say that art, despite this and what's happening here and what happens in New York, is not uh, necessarily America. We're living, after all, in the most Europeanized, the most cultural, the most uh, sophisticated city in the country. And true, certain things do happen here. They don't necessarily happen in Indianapolis, and they don't necessarily happen in uh, lots of other places that I can mention. Uh, there is a, there still is a struggle for the artist to to raise himself out of uh, uh, unemployment, shall we say, into employment. Can you tell us about the mother of us all? It's one of those things. It did not get publicized. Um, uh, Barbara Lee, everything, all the color photography got focused in on tall ships. But um, it, it was an extraordinary event. It, it, I learned that it's the second most expensive recorded opera in, in musical history, and that's for an odd reason. And what was your involvement? My involvement started 12 years ago. Um, in my 1964 show at the Stable Gallery, it was my second one-man show, I wanted to have a, a little bit more than a table with a few glasses of wine and so forth. I really wanted to have a nice opening. And I, what I wanted was a, a musical opening. And I came to that because when I looked around at my work in the, in the studio before it went to the gallery, I realized that just by some peculiar chance, every painting that I painted for that 64 show, the theme of each painting was a theme that Virgil Thompson had dealt with. Now, I had known Virgil Thompson since my, his music since my art school days in Chicago. <coughs> Uh, I just got hooked on Four Saints in Three Acts. I thought it was one of the most, one of the most lovely things that had ever been written in America. So, therefore, in 1965, uh, I started working on The Mother of Us All, and I've done two productions, one at the Tyrone Guthrie in Minneapolis, and finally the one in Santa Fe this summer. And it was a bicentennial celebration. It was an absolute extravaganza, and uh, my work reached its culmination there. That was the sets and the costumes? The sets and costumes for the mother of us all. What will happen to that material? That material will probably not be repeated in opera form, but it's going to be set up in a tableau vivant, or tab, tab, tableau mort, I guess, um, <laughs> in my retrospective at the University of Texas this, this fall. Well, we look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Robert Indiana. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein.